Hello ladies and gentlemen, we are at GPEC Summit and I have the pleasure to have next to me Will Reynolds. Will, uh, welcome. Well, thank you for having me. How was the event so far? It was great so far. I'm the first person up, <laughs> so I had a great time. You are the, the, the one who, you know, kicked off the, the fun, all the fun here. Yeah. Uh, and how was the crowd? Any interesting Very question? Cool. Um, yeah, at the end, um, so I like that tool that you were using, the slide, the whatever, slide.io. It was um, the tool that brings all the audience questions in because it let us kind of scan through some of the okay. questions we got. Okay. And I got some really good ones. What was the best? Uh, the best one that I got was the one, oh my God, I'm forgetting what her name was. Uh, she was all the way in the middle. She was asking about what Google is proactively doing to help make sure that people aren't spending money on search terms that maybe they shouldn't be spending money on. And that answer is not a whole lot. Okay, okay. Uh, for our readers and viewers who, of course, didn't attend the event, uh, what were the main, uh, you know, takeaways from your presentation? They should, uh, they should know. I think the number one thing that I was trying to convey to people today was that um, most of your, not most of your spend, but a good chunk of your spend in paid, and on those paid ads, the paid clicks, the shopping ads, are happening on these really small micro search keywords. And if you ignore them, very often they're the ones that are getting a lot of your conversions, and usually they're costing you, you know, 30, 40% of your spend, but yet we kind of are allowing Google's AI to automatically manage those words. And today I wanted to show people some missteps in how Google manages that and to make sure that people are aware of how to check up to make sure that Google's AI and automation is actually working for them. Can we name one or two? Uh, I think the best example was the one I showed, the turkey example today. You know, I showed how Google's using some, like, you know, Google has different ways of saying, oh, well, we'll match a close phrase to that phrase because we know that it's what you wanted. And in generally, I think that's a good thing. However, if you're a client that sells turkey meat, okay. uh, you probably don't want to be showing up for words that are Turkish. It's a totally different thing. Yes. <laughs> um, and it seems like Google's machine learning missed that one for one of our clients. And our client then is getting clicks on those ads where they're saying, we sell Turkey, and somehow people looking for Turkish clothes, Turkish coffee, are clicking on my client's results, costing them money. And that's bad. <laughs> that's I think bad so, for because the business. it doesn't convert. It doesn't convert, <laughs> yes. it's a lot of money spent. <laughs> you previously said that ranking is not enough to drive success. Um, suppose you were the owner of an online shop, yeah? Uh, what would you focus on uh, in your marketing strategy uh, at the moment, uh, considering that SEO is not enough? You know, um, It's funny, I think when we rank for things, mm -hmm. we have this belief that, oh, if I rank, people are going to click. And I think the thing that we forget about is, especially with brands in e-commerce, is people have trusted brands that they know already. So in the U.S., it might be Walmart, Home Depot, Amazon. So if people are looking for those brands, and I see your, your, your company up there, I'm almost like, well, I've gone to Home Depot before. I know how far they are from my house. I know about their return policy. So even if you outrank Home Depot, in my opinion, for certain products, there's a good chance that I'm not going to click on your result anyway. So I think it's really important to build up on your brand so that you start to become trusted. Or otherwise, you know, I might just skip over the top result that might be you to click on somebody who I know has a good return policy and a really broad product selection, for instance. Um, nowadays, we tend to focus a lot on, you know, uh, the technical part of SEO, on link building, for example. But uh, in your opinion, what would be uh, a top three of, uh, you know, um, link building approaches and technical, uh, technical approaches? You know what? So those are two areas that I haven't spent as much time on recently. Okay. Um, but what I can tell you is I think that there is a... So I think that... Technical SEOs are going to solve most problems with technical SEO solutions. Okay. And link building SEOs are going to solve those same problems with link building solutions. And content SEOs are going to solve those problems with content. And I think what we're missing is that strategic layer in the data to tell us when we might not need to use a technical implementation because people are ranking already without having it. But a technical SEO is going to be like, you have to do these things. Or a link builder is going to be like, well, we need links. And you're like, well, how many do I need? 
Okay. Well, I don't know how many you need to rank for this word. Well, as many as possible. <laughs> as many as possible. Okay. And then you're like, well, these other sites are ranking above me without any links. So, how help me to understand the value? And I think that it, I think that we too often lead in with technical content, SEO, etc. And we need to really start from a place of data mm -hmm. and say, where does the data show me I need links? Where does the data show me that I need to fix this thing technically or that I need content? Because right now, I think myself included, mm -hmm. everybody has their own like leaning. So I'm more of a content style SEO. So I'm gonna run in and solve most problems with content. But then I didn't pull the data to see if maybe I should have started off solving it with links or with technical. Okay. So what you're saying to resume this in just one idea is that we should focus more on the value that we bring to our customers basically. Absolutely, absolutely. Okay. I think too many of us are, you know, it's hard to, for me to pinpoint this in a short kind of snippet, but it's, it's lack of data. The lack of data is leading content SEOs to go, it's gotta be content, we have to make all this content, right? And it's like, well, says how, how many pages of content do I need? Um, do those words even matter to me? Or well, I, don't, I don't know, right? So I feel like we have to start from a place of data to determine what type of SEO we need. Or if you ask a technical SEO, you're gonna get a technical SEO solution. If you ask a content SEO, you're gonna get a content solution. Yes. If it's a link building SEO, you're gonna get a link building solution. And none of them are looking at the data across other divisions to say, maybe you do need technical and not mm -hmm, me right now. Mm -hmm. But what if uh, we are speaking about um, an online shop that that's just starting, you know, the yeah. in this business. They don't have any data in the uh, beginning. Well, so what you should do is start off paying for the data. Paying for the data, so okay. I say start off paying for the clicks because there's so much value in the clicks that you get from Google. So then I can see, okay, I paid for these words. How many people clicked on three or four pages? What search terms led to people adding to cart, even if they didn't convert? And you can start to say, well, wow, these terms led to a lot of people leaving. So now I know, don't build content for those words yet, because those people bounced. But you have data now to tell you not to go after a word versus I think that microphones are important. Well, shouldn't we go after the word microphones? for three or four weeks and see if those people actually elicit behavior on the website that says they're interested in buying before we go and spend months and months and months of resources to build out new content and links and do technical. And most people are like, yeah, I probably should spend the money for a couple weeks to get the data to tell me whether or not I should do that. So I go back to pay and get the data which will tell you what to do first, second, third, and fourth. And if I'm not mistaken, you're also speaking about you know running some some tests before uh, defining a marketing strategy or a, a new a new direction for your business, I, right? I, absolutely. I can't tell you how many people have come to me and said, "Hey, I need a hundred links a month," and then I say, "Okay, um, how did you determine that?" And they go silent. <laughs> no data. No data. No yeah. data. They're literally just making it up, and I'm saying. That's fine, I could go get you 100 links and you could pay me money for that. But shouldn't we try to understand the data that says, yes, for all these words you want to target, links are or aren't important before we just go and do it? Okay, uh, so I have here that studies predict that by 2020, 50% of online search will be voice search. From your experience so far, uh, what are the you know the steps a business needs to take in order to uh, uh, you know optimize for for voice search? What what do you think? So the thing that we're currently telling every client to do, okay. every client, because I don't know how much voice is or isn't going to hit those numbers. Right now, there's no way. I mean, mm -hmm. we're six months away from 2020. Yeah, that's Did true. Did you do half of your searches today via voice? Mm, no, no, right. no. Right. Most people no. aren't there yet. But um, my hypothesis, my belief, mm -hmm. is that most of the time, the voice answer is uh, what's in the that answer box that on Google. Okay. So what I tell my clients to do is, let's get all of your branded search words for your brand. So these are people who know your brand where an answer box shows up. And how often are we not the answer? Because that's really bad if when somebody says, how late is your bank open on Fridays, and the answer is coming from another website, that's really bad. Yeah. So my first step is, let's use your paid data, look at all the different searches people have done with your brand, see which ones are triggering answer boxes, and the ones that are triggering the answer boxes where you're not the answer, fix those answer boxes first because they're going to be mismatches for voice. I see. Data. 
Always get, yes. get the data and then it'll tell you what to do. Always looking at the numbers. Always look at the data. <laughs> yeah, okay. Um, could you give one to uh, example of uh, examples of online marketing uh, specialists or, you know, uh, people we all should follow and read online, uh, except yourself, of course. <laughs> okay. um, so I won't give out the typical names. Like, you know, like people should by now, they should be following Rand Fishkin and Dharmesh mm -hmm. Shah and people like that. Um, I will tell you, I get a lot of value out of following Dan Shore. Okay. Um, I mentioned him in my presentation today. And the guy just constantly finds things that I didn't even, wasn't even looking at, you know, and that most of the industry wasn't looking at. So when I'm looking for new people to follow or people I get a lot of value from following, I look for the people who aren't always as well known but are doing really interesting work. I um, mean, Dan Shore is one of the people that I just love to read his work. Well, thank you so much. Thank well, you thank for joining you. the event. It was a pleasure. Thanks for having me here. <laughs> and I hope uh, I'm going to see you again uh, next year. Who knows? I hope so. All right. <laughs> thank you. Thank you.